This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Welcome back to the Cyber Underground, everybody. I'm the professor, no longer the cyber guy because there's somebody else out there as a cyber guy. So I'm the professor now. Once again, I teach for the University of Hawaii Kapiolani Community College. Uh, shout out to our new department chair for the uh, Business, Legal, and Technology Department, uh, Laura Burke. Uh, welcome, and we're happy to have you. I know you're just watching the show. She just found out we have a show. <laughs> she didn't even know. <laughs> uh, welcome. Today we got some updates and some great topics for you and some really lively discussion. I have with me here, again, our great guest, J.T. Ash, HIPAA Compliance Officer from the University of Hawaii. Welcome, brother. Welcome. Welcome. How you doing, man? Happy New Year, my friend. Happy New Year. How are your holidays? First show of the year, right? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, 2019. So this is Blade Runner year. Is it Blade Runner This year? is Blade Runner year, and the opening of Blade Runner says Los Angeles 2019. Mm -hmm. A little different than the movie. <laughs> Just a, unless everybody's a replicant, and I don't know. See, not, not, it you, could. you might be onto something. <laughs> You definitely so, might be onto something. I, I love I love when we hit those years that people predicted would be a certain way. There's 1984. Uh, there was a sci-fi show about the year 1999. Mm -hmm. uh, BBC had it. it was uh, the moon broke away from the Earth. You remember this one? I, 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 I'm really not a weird. big movie fan, but I always remember Y2K and how we spent what was it 18 months to two years trying to fix everything that we're supposed to break when <laughs> Y2K came around and everybody was sitting there in their data center at midnight or whatever it may be and. Bro. Yeah, but there was a lot of great drinking and parties there, in that. There was <laughs> definitely all, that, all the IT people were yes, gathered around, yes, right? Yes, because everybody was at the data center at, at midnight. That was it was true. good money. Yeah. I remember working that, that two yeah. years old code, yep. right? It was yep. a COBOL, Pascal, all that stuff we had to update. All that, the good that, stuff. That was good. That was good money back then. Yeah. I missed that. <laughs> good old days. Uh, now, we need to go so back to those. 20 years ago yes. now. It is 20 years ago. Wow, we're old. Yes. We're old. Okay, let's do some quick updates. Okay. I always uh, give some updates to my, my folks out there. Uh, Android, again, uh, malicious updates. Uh, we got um, Google Play had Flappy Bird Dog, Flappy Bird, Flashlight, and several others uh, that are all now removed, but we're collecting data in the phones and sending a lot of stuff back, including your passwords and uh, the websites you visited, your behavior, uh, your geolocation, and uh, would pop up every once in a while a uh, fake screen saying you, you had to re-log into Google or you had to re-log into Facebook. Mm -hmm. And of course, people of course do that. So of you're course. sending your credentials to the what they have as a command and control server. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's what's happened. Uh, there's another one out there that this one looks like it's collecting data and they don't want to call it malicious yet, but it mm -hmm. is odd. It's called Weather Forecast. It's on the Google Play Store. Uh, it's made by China's TCL Corp, or Communications Corp, and uh, they actually make uh, TVs that you can get in Costco. Mm -hmm. So this is a big company, and they made this application, and it's collecting IMEI numbers. Any, any relation to ZTE or Huawei or anything like that? I don't know, but we should repeat. Probably about, yeah. Hawaii and ZTE, as of February uh, last year, the, uh, the all this security services said, don't use these devices. Mm -hmm. We don't recommend using them. Uh, then, I guess Trump made a deal. Yes, he did. He said ZTE put 400 million in this <laughs> account and we can let you do business in the US. And then, it, all I can imagine is the money must have run out because he yes. changed his mind. Yes, of course. <laughs> and he said, you can't do this anymore. <laughs> I need more money. Kind of yeah. like the, you know, ransomware in, in, in his own little way. This is thing. like White House ransomware? Exactly. This is perfect. Perfect. <laughs> so you know, might not think he's too smart, but it sure seems like he's got it going on in that particular sense. Wow, well sense. done. I got 400 yeah. million and then, oh, I'll stop you doing what you need to do. Why, this is more like the mob. Yes. <laughs> no, Trump and the mob, never. <laughs> well, this one's, this one's interesting. Now, the, the first ones that I just mentioned that have been taken off the Play Store, they, um, they took advantage of something that we haven't been really focused on our monitoring very well. Mm -hmm. So when you want to put something in the iOS store, you know, the app store for mm -hmm. uh, Apple, or you want to put something in Google Play Store, they will examine your code. Mm -hmm. They'll give it a cursory look to see if there's any malware in there. And the signatures always pop up if you've pasted code in there. Mm -hmm. However, if you deliver an app to the store and later you update it, the updates come directly from you're kidding. The manufacturers, uh, very seldom do they come through the app store. So wow. they are not checked. So you can, and this one was, delivering the malicious payload via the first update. China delivering malicious payload? You're kidding. 
I'm not. Okay, it's that, hard that is to believe. Just stunning to me that China would do something like that. You know, <laughs> heaven forbid they have to invent anything on their own. They get pretty good to just steal everything, right? Well, that's that's their that's yeah. their gimmick, right? Okay. They they want to be into everybody's play field. I think maybe the United States might have set the standard many years ago, mm -hmm. and um, everyone just said, okay, we'll sure. play that game. Sure, <laughs> we're that, all on the same playing field. Yes, we are. <laughs> we are. I think I think that's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. um, these uh, these uh, software applications that you, you can download for your desktop too mm -hmm. uh, come with some software that runs in the background. You know about helper yep. applications. Yep. These are these are little things that run in the background that help you update and tell you that Java needs an update mm -hmm. or Adobe needs an update. Well, we're seeing a lot more malicious code directed at those helper functions, yeah. so they can pop up and say, "Hey, uh, you need an Adobe update. Click here," and you think it's coming from your computer, but you don't actually go to Adobe to get the update. That's the malicious link, right? So, so uh, I would update uh, Adobe Flash. Adobe just sent out critical updates on IS uh, Cert mm -hmm. this morning. Um, also, Clean My Mac X has mal uh, not malicious code now. There's a, a, a dozen or so different places where you could insert uh, mm -hmm. a m buffer overflow or a memory uh, exception to, to get into the computer and take command and control of that computer. Now, when uh, this malicious code activates, you always know it because you see a lot more internet activity. It's con connecting to its command and control server somewhere on the internet. Mm -hmm. So it's one of the clear signs, you know, hey, my internet spiked. Why? I'm not doing anything. I'm not doing anything. What's going on? So Your TV's probably beaconing out or something like that. Right, or someone's got Netflix <laughs> running, right? <laughs> so true. I, my daughter always has Netflix going on. Updates, uh, Google's uh, probably getting rid of Android. Really? Yeah, we're looking at a, a code base called Fuchsia. It's written, and check this out, it's written in C, C++, Dart, Go, Python, Rust, Shell, and Swift. Pretty much anything that you can imagine would run on any platform. So when you, when you read the description of Fuchsia and you go on Git and, uh, and you look at GitHub and all the updates, you're looking at the, the master line that they have could be compiled for any OS out there for any platform. Mm -hmm. This is mobile code, this is uh, you know, Intel processor, Motorola process, here's your, your uh, ARM processor. Mm -hmm. It'll run on anything. Uh, so we're looking at uh, Fuchsia for the future. And it's crazy because I, I, from a healthcare perspective, I keep hearing about Amazon and Google and Apple all getting into the healthcare and EMR, EHR world. So that's going to be uh, interesting to see. It sounds like it's just a piece of metal and they're just using code to access a platform. I think that's all it's going to yeah. become. I think that's yeah. how everything's going to become. Now. It's going to be a hard choice, though. I mean, just for I mean, how many years have we had like three choices? Yes. That's it. Yes. We, we have the Linux, Unix world, yep. we have Mac, and we have Windows. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to have Fuchsia, now we're going to have an Apple OS, now we're going to have a, you know, how many other vendors are going to jump in the pool? I, I, I think laptops and, and desktops and, and actually physical servers, like several, you know, you're going to have to have physical servers in a data center. You're not going to have laptops anymore. You're not going to have uh, desktops anymore. That's, that's kind of scary, future. but if, if you open up a, like a Google Chromebook mm -hmm. and you don't have access to the internet, we have very limited functionality. Mm -hmm. So now we have to have an internet. Well, what kind of functionality does a normal user need to really have? I mean, I can understand from an administrative perspective, you might want to have some elevated privileges, but most people, all they do is they go on email, they want to surf the web, they want to go get pictures of, you know, they want Siri to go get pictures of their grandkids or anything like that. So once again, uh, I don't think the, um, Processing power is really as needed as if you're talking about doing some type of AI or machine learning or anything like that. That's going to be always in the background and almost kind of like a, a full circle. We're going back to the data center where the, uh, oh, the dumb terminals. Yes, <laughs> yes, we're going to have a dumb yeah. terminal and, and all of the machines are going as long as you can. I think the when we started with uh, 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 data centers and you needed access, you had to sit there and schedule access to the to the to the to the data center, but then we're going, okay, we could never get any access to the data center, so that's when we get distributed computers. Now I think we're going back to where we're putting everything back into a data center, and as long as we can get access to the data center, we're good to go. Now this is a cycle we've seen, now you and I have been in IT long enough. For the people in the cheap me. seats, yeah. way back when, when we were in college, yeah. you had to request access to the data center, yep. you had to sit at a dumb terminal, and mm -hmm. at your time slot you could log in, mm -hmm. and your terminal did nothing. No. You had a keyboard and a monitor. That didn't was even it. play Pong back and forth. Really. <laughs> this is nothing. Yeah. You just had access to a mainframe somewhere. Then we went to uh, applications that were uh, on a computer. Mm -hmm. like we had PCs in the home. We thought that was great. Then in the 90s, we, we 
we troubled ourselves with this cloud thing. Mm -hmm. uh, we tried it. We had uh, online applications, and it worked for, I don't know, a year until we figured we just didn't have the bandwidth mm -hmm. to do that, right? Yep. And now 20 years later, we're back to the same model. So we just keep coming back to it. There's something about and the ease of distributing an application mm -hmm. and updates to the application if everybody's accessing it on a single point, mm -hmm. right? And if you have the processing power and the bandwidth to access it, then it is good. It's a good ubiquitous target and everyone can use it yeah. and everyone gets the latest, most secure edition all the time. There's a reason why, you know, you've been through the, the Windows 7, Windows 10, and, <laughs> and probably well, uh, NT back in the days. Right. And once again, Office 365 is so available and so ready Plus, they're making the new Windows 2016 so expensive that it doesn't make business sense to actually do it yourself. They want to force you to go and, and almost kind of like the storage places where you sit there and you store your, your old furniture or whatever it may be. You keep paying that bill every month and you're going, man, where did my furniture go? Oh, yeah, it's in that storage place that I had three years ago that you've been paying every <laughs> month. I have a feeling that Office 365 and all of those data centers are going to be like that where we just throw up all of our stuff in there and going, Oh, I guess we're just going to pay for it for the rest of our lives. This is more ways to lose yes. stuff. Yes. You, may, you know, when we were growing up, it's always, oh, it's in the attic. How many oh, people, it's in the closet. Yeah, how many people <laughs> out there still have a storage room where are they going, I wonder what's in there. Oh. <laughs> I, I, when's the last time I actually went out to the storage place and saw what was in there? There's, there's, there comes a point when you're afraid yeah. to open the door. Yes. It's like, I just don't want to get into it right now. I'll buy a new hammer. Yes. Because I don't. <laughs> exactly. But that's it. You're going to buy a new computer, and it's like, oh, I don't know where my data went. Well, don't worry. It's in China or Russia or... You're wherever yeah. the distributed <laughs> stuff is going, right? That's, that's a little scary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's, let's get into it now. We're okay. talking about um, the leadership and companies of this week's topic. Yep. I'm saying that CEOs need to get behind cybersecurity in a way that's effective across the enterprise. Mm -hmm. And what I'm seeing is CEOs have been so budget conscious, mm -hmm. focused on the bottom line and the share price in 90 days, mm -hmm. and satisfying the shareholders and the board of, of directors, that they're forgetting that the stakeholders of the company, the employees and, and their customers, are actually under a significant risk for the loss of data, mm -hmm. the invasion of privacy, mm -hmm. and a huge amount of money loss. Mm -hmm. So shareholders too can lose money for company gets breached, mm -hmm. right? You know, I'm sure Home Depot and Target, they, they lost a lot of share price on that one. They're um, coming back up. They're coming back up. Right? But if the CEOs had had, in my opinion, a little bit more foresight mm -hmm. uh, and not been so old school about share price, they could have prevented that and kept their stock on a very even keel and been able to tell the shareholders, we're taking care of you. And, and, and I'm going to Agree with what you're trying to do, okay. <laughs> but I'm going to totally disagree with what you're trying to, uh, how you're trying to go about it. And what I'm talking about this, a friend of mine that I used to work with, a colleague at, at, where I used to work, always told me when he did different types of risk modeling, you have to have certain assumptions in the beginning, certain foundations in the beginning. Other than, if you don't have those assumptions in the beginning, you can always argue the outcomes or whatever it may be. Now, I believe that CEOs are smart. I, I cannot believe that a CEO ever gets hired if they're not smart. That has yeah, to you be, and I are diverging that, that, on this. That has idea. to be an assumption that I have to make <laughs> that they're going to do the right things. Um, I, I believe CEOs and business leaders have limited resources. I, I think we could at least agree that they have limited resources. They do have limited that, that they resources. They have to do that. Yeah. So with those two particular things, I do believe that CEOs and business leaders have dealt with risk for the... 30, 40 years, it's, it's nothing new to them. And, and I keep hearing from everybody telling me, cyber risk is business risk. Well, if- No, no, no. I, I think there's, it, there's a divergence there too. Okay. I, I believe, in, in my opinion, and we should get into this after the break. Okay. In my opinion, CEOs have understood risk for yep. generations. What I don't think they understand is the risk in the information world and ones and zeros and what they cannot feel and touch and look at and see. And, and there's, there's this information that's floating around that they really have not been able to conceptualize that risk. I, I agree with you 100% on that premise, but I, I'd like to get into the why. Okay, let's do that right after the break. We're going to take a break, come back in about one minute. We'll pay some bills. Till then, stay safe. え、各週月曜日の2時からお届けしています。
日本語コミュニティハワイの日本語コミュニティに便利なお助け情報ニュースなどをゲストをお招きしてお届けする番組ですこんにちはハワイ各週の月曜日2時からぜひ皆さん見てくださいホストの国瀬ゆかりでしたアロハアロハ My name is Mark Shklov I am the host of ThinkTech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea Law Across the Sea is on ThinkTech Hawaii every other Monday at 11 a.m. Please join me where my guests talk about law topics and ideas and music and Hawaiiana all across the sea from Hawaii and back again. Aloha. Welcome back. Thanks for staying with us over that minute. I、uh, hope you enjoyed the commercials. We're at the Cyber Underground. I'm here with JT Ash, and we got a lively discussion going. Two different opinions on how we should approach cyber risk in the enterprise. I'm saying CEOs need to step up and do more. And Jay, I, I, I'm saying that CISOs、thing. need to step up and do more. And, and CISOs. And, and here's my perspective, and, and it's kind of like me and you kind of thing, because we're kind of like the yin and the yang. I'm more of the vulnerabilities. Internally, looking at myself, trying to figure out what I can do to protect myself. You're more of the external, let's look at the threats, and then once I understand the threats, you're an external facing things, but it's kind of an out of control type of thing. So in, instead of CEOs being cyber champions, I'm saying CISOs need to be business champions because if I'm a business champion, if I understand from a Healthcare perspective. If I understand how revenue is made, if I understand how controlled substances are done, if I understand those business processes, I can help protect their information better from an internal myself. What can I do myself? I can't control what a CEO is going to do. I can't control what a threat's going to do unless I sit there and try to put a, 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 a honeypot or something like that. I can control it that particular way. But other than that, I really have no control over the threats. Or the CEOs, I have control over what I can do as a CISO and what I can do as eliminating any or mitigating any vulnerabilities. I think we jumped forward here with the assumption we have a CISO. True, true, but I, I think you do have a CISO because I, I was、uh, listening to a podcast or a webcast the other day, and actually, you have had a CISO for the last 30 years. It's just been another name, it's called a CIO. The CIO is branched off into like five different.、Uh, Uh, C suite, you've got a CISO, you've got a chief data officer, you've got a chief technology officer, and you still have the CIO there. So, once again, the CIO was all of these things back when me and you were younger, type of thing. So, I do believe that we've always had the CISOs. Just like when we started working, when they branched off the CISOs to the CIOs, we had to sit there and convince the CIOs why it was in their best interest to do hardening, to do patching. To do different things because once again, it's going to expend their human capital. And, and once again, they, they've got only limited resources or whatever like that. So, once again, just like this particular perspective of business, I need to talk in money terms to a CEO and I need to convince him why it's in his best interest to do certain things. Because once again,、uh, when you're talking, when something happens, when the target guy gets breached or whatever it may be,、um, CEO wants a couple things. One, Have we fixed it? Two, do I have a story to tell? And that's going to be the big thing. They want to have a story to tell that, hey, I had the NIST cybersecurity framework. Our maturity level was three. We had protections in place. We had detecting. We have a SIM in place. We have a vulnerability management system. We have an incident response plan that gets tested on a year basis. So, once again, he wants to have that story to tell that says, hey, shareholders, hey, board of directors, we did everything human as possible. But Both me and you know, you can do anything you want, <laughs> everything humanly possible, and if somebody really wants to get your stuff, they're going to get sure, it. Sure, if they spend enough resources, yeah. Yeah, you can be a target of a nation、yeah. state and there's no defense at all.、Yeah. I, I, I think I was more talking about,、uh, you know, Target's one of them. I think they both got breached through point of sale、mm-hmm. systems, right? Target、yeah. and, and Home Depot. But、um, my, my biggest、uh, my gripe is、um, breaches like、uh, WannaCry against the UK health system, the、mm-hmm. NHS went down. They were using Windows 7. They made a conscious decision、mm-hmm. not to upgrade that operating system or even patch it. Of course, that patch wasn't even available.、Mm-hmm. Microsoft had to customize it. But they could have upgraded their, their operating、mm-hmm. system 
but they made a conscious decision not to, and in doing so, they accepted the risk. Yes. And it was complete fail. Yes. So, do you, you don't think that the leadership championing cybersecurity and knowing more about cybersecurity would have maybe changed that outcome? Um, yes and no. And the reason I say yes okay. and no is, is because... I love those answers. Yes I, and no. I believe <laughs> the CEO and the board has to set the risk posture, the risk culture. And mm -hmm. once again, I'm the CEO. I'm telling my business lines, this is our risk appetite. So once again, this is what I'm willing to accept. This isn't what I'm not willing to accept. CISO, here are the resources that you need to achieve the risk posture that I've sent out. And once again, if I'm not implementing his desires for that risk posture, because once again, I don't, it's, I've seen so many places where they're going, well, what's our risk appetite? It's like, well, what did the CISO say? Well, the CISO doesn't set the risk appetite for, because once again, we don't control the risk. We don't bring the risk into the company. It's that person who wants to sit there and do the new, we want to integrate all of these uh, information feeds so we can put AI in, in practice and make better decisions or whatever it may be. So once again, when those guys bring risk into the, in, in, into the environment, they have to understand the risk appetite. And once again, I have to go and let that CEO know, this is what I need to meet and achieve your risk appetite that you've sent for the company. So if they say no. And, and once again, they've tacitly or uh, overtly kind of accepted the risk. And once again, that's their job. They, they get, once again, they're juggling balls. And, and right, once right. again, I, I do believe this. And, and when I've worked for as many CAOs as I have, their number one main thing and where they get paid and where they get their money from is growth. They want their company to grow. Sure. And, and if you understand that, that, that their big thing is to grow the company, so once again, so the shareholders are happy, so the users are happy, how can I, as the CISO, help the company grow? And once again, you're looking at it from his perspective and you're helping him achieve his goal. He's usually pretty um, amiable to give you what you want and what you need because you, he knows you're not just in it for security, you're in it because you want to achieve the goal of growth for the company. Well, that's a good point, and, and we should talk about if, if we're helping achieve that growth mm -hmm. for a company, so we're going from this, a corp, it's a corporate posture, mm -hmm. we're in an enterprise, we come in as a security uh, person, a mm -hmm. CISO, CIO maybe, mm -hmm. and we say, we want to help you grow. Uh, do you think, and I'm going to tell you, this is my opinion, mm -hmm. I think that CEOs, especially in the United States, mm -hmm. have far too great an appetite for risk. Mm -hmm. They just, they, they see that six month or three month share price and that's all they can see. And if they see that you need to spend uh, X number of million on a, uh, a bunch of security upgrades mm -hmm. and it's going to prevent them from getting another 20 cents per share, mm -hmm. they're going to say no. And, and probably if you were a CEO, you'd probably say no too. Because once again, when I sit there and tell them this is your risk posture, there's no guarantee that it's going to happen. Um, one of the wonderful things about being in security is we used to talk about possibilities all the time. We'd go out to the bar, have a beer and say, well, if this happened, this would really happen. Or if this would happen, this would really happen. But I think we've evolved as a community in security and we start talking about probabilities, not possibilities. Don't tell me what's possible because I know you know that anything's possible when it comes to technology. But tell me what's probable. Give me a prob probability statement that's saying, okay, uh, I think there's a 10% chance that there's going to be a tsunami this year. And, and if there's a tsunami this year, it's going to have this range of, 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 of damage that's, or impact or whatever it may be. And if you can give him something like that, he's going to say, I have enough information to make an informed decision. If you sit there in Nebraska and you tell them that there's a 10% chance of having a tsunami, they're going to probably tell you to go pack sand. That's just how it goes. So once again, I think we've evolved as a community and as a security community that we don't come to them with possibilities. We come to them with probabilities. This is a probability that might happen. And if it does, this could be, this is the range of impact that it could happen. And once again, if you have insurance, that will bring the impact to maybe a tolerable level or within the risk appetite of the company. So so, once again, it's a whole shell game. No, I agree thing. with you. I just think, um, I think we've been changing at such a rapid pace, right? We were level for many years through the 90s and early 2000s, mm -hmm. and then we started to increase the risk of these cyber 
breaches and um, cyber incidents. Mm -hmm. And now we've done this asymptotic launch yes. curve, right? And we're uh, the last two years, uh, this is two shows ago, I believe, I, I brought up the statistic that uh, out of a, a surveyed company, uh, 2,500 mm -hmm. companies were surveyed over six countries, mm -hmm. and 90% of them said, we've had at least one cyber incident that brought us to our knees mm -hmm. and interrupted business services, at least in the last 24 months. Now, out of those 24 months, 75% of the same companies said they'd had more than one, mm -hmm. maybe even three, in the same 24-month period. So I don't think before that we were so sure we were going to get a cyber incident. Now, it's almost the sure. Now, instead of there's a 10% probability that it's going to happen, now we're saying there's a 10% chance you're going to escape it. Yes. And, and it's funny that I think if there's that fulcrum, and you can help me with this, right? Mm -hmm. We have to achieve a balance in a company, right? Yes. How much security do we want to put into something versus how much it's worth, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And, and if you say, well, we got to put $4 billion into security, well, what are we protecting? $4 billion. Well, now it doesn't really have any yes. value, right? It has so no we, value whatsoever. We've got to balance the equation. So how do, how do we effectively tell the CI, uh, CEOs and CIOs, listen, balance the equation by putting this much into it because you're protecting this. Sometimes I think the value is missed when you say it's not just the fact that you lost a million credit card numbers and you're going to get fined a buck mm -hmm. seventy-five yeah. per number, right? It's not just that; it's bad PR, right? Mm -hmm. uh, no faith in your in your business at the mm -hmm. point of sale, right? You're going to lose money. Your share price is going to go down. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of loss to to put into a breach. And as of last year, the average this is 2018 yeah. data now. The average Breach data loss in financial dollars came out to seven and a half million dollars per breach. Mm -hmm. Small companies wiped out. Wiped medium out. companies on the on the brink. A mm -hmm. medium company might be able to weather one of those, mm -hmm. but two, you're dead. Yeah. So this is this is a big company tolerance that mm -hmm. you could do, but everybody else, the risk. Uh, tolerance has got to be pretty low, don't you think? Well, I, what what I think we've done, and I think we missed the boat. Uh, when, when we started doing all of these particular things because it was very easy back in the days when everything was in a data center. Mm. But, but then you had new businesses saying, I want to do this, 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 and this. IT, help me out. I need to do this, this, and this. And IT's going, I don't have the skill set. I don't have this. Okay, I'm going to go put it in the cloud. I'm going to go put it in Amazon. <laughs> I'm going to go put it at AWS. And once again, the threat surface jumped. Exponentially. From, exponentially. Yeah, so yeah. once again, where we... I'm a big proponent of the NIST cyber framework and all that stuff. And it, you have identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. And we missed the boat when it was coming time to identify because the CISO doesn't identify where your jewels are. Yeah. The CIO doesn't identify where your jewels are. The businesses have to come in and having to, once again, value your bi assets. business line come yeah. in and tell me okay you're using this application application a and application a uh, supports this business process if this business process is not working for a day how much money do we lose and yeah. we haven't we had got about 30 oh, seconds okay. left i know this is an yeah. awesome topic and I, let's just do this yeah. again yeah, yeah i want to keep doing this with the last 30 seconds do you got anything to tell us about the university of hawaii and what you're doing um university of hawaii uh, we've been maturing as a as a, as a program and we're actually going through our uh, assessments program right now. So once again, we're maturing as a program. A lot of the clinics uh, are taking a really hard look at and actually identifying where their crown jewels are and making sure that at least we understand where our information flow and our information exists. Where to apply the yes. security. Yes, so once again, we're starting at the beginning where you should. Hey, thanks for being on board. Sir, I really appreciate year. it. Aloha. Yeah. Thanks again for being on the Cyber Underground with us, everybody. Join us next week for another exciting episode. We'll try to make it as good as this one. <laughs> Aloha, everybody. Stay safe.